Good morning, everyone, and welcome um, to our second day. Welcome to uh, those who weren't able to join us last night. So just so that um, you realise what uh, we're doing, um, yesterday's theme was uh, gratitude, so we had an extended reflection on, uh, on gratitude. And uh, today's theme is Salesian Lovers. Tomorrow is uh, Wounded Sinners. On Wednesday, uh, Edna MacDonald uh, takes over for the day um, and is exploring Maria Mazzarello's contribution to, unique contribution to our Salesian charism. And then Thursday, we look at uh, Salesians as Dreamers. And Friday, um, solutions as shepherd, shepherds, prophets, and missionaries. And uh, as we go through that, um, each day we have a substantive conference in the morning, and then uh, in the afternoon from five o'clock, um, sort of extended meditation uh, reflection time, similar to last night. So. Today we're reflecting on this idea of Salesians as lovers. And as Salesians, um, if we are not lovers, we are nothing. In the light of the sexual abuse crisis, it might, um, it might be shocking to even utter such a statement. And yet, it's a fundamental truth. As St. Paul says so pointedly, if I speak with the tongues of humans and of angels and I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away my, all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I can boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. If we have not love, we're nothing. In fact, to love is the most fundamental of human vocations. If God is love and we're made in the image of God, then love is the spark of the divine within us. It's in loving that we're most complete as a person, as a Christian, as a Salesian. It's in loving that we encounter God. We profess that we are Salesians because of the love of the Lord Jesus who calls us to follow him. Ours is a response of love to the God who has loved us first. And as so many of us know, this is a love that is a journey of a lifetime. I don't know how many have seen this uh, beautiful film of, of gods and men. Um, beautiful film, the story of nine French Cistercian monks who were living peacefully and harmoniously uh, with amongst the local Muslims in a remote village in the Atlas Mountains in Alg Algeria. In fact, like in Europe of old, the monastery came first and the village formed around, around the monastery. So those Muslim people came to gather around and make a village around the Christian Catholic monastery. The film narrates the beautiful relationship between the monks and the local people, the local Muslims, the growing threats to their safety, there being everyone, the monks and the people, the monks' eventual decision to stay at the monastery despite the dangers and ultimately the martyrdom of seven of those nine monks. 
along with 12 other martyrs of Algeria, they were beatified on the 8th of December, 8th of December, 2018. Early in the film, there's a beautiful encounter between Brother Luke, a medical doctor, and a young Muslim woman, a girl almost, who seeks his advice. It's in French with English subtitles. I hope people at the back can read the subtitles. Well, what a beautiful encounter between uh, Brother Luke and that young woman. There's a gentle simplicity and yet profound wisdom in uh, Brother Luke's responses to the girl. To love means appreciating and responding to the presence of another person, <coughs> recognising the joy of being with them, Sensing it with your whole body, your whole self. Feeling yourself come alive in their presence. And knowing the turmoil too. The confusion that comes from knowing that your life is bound irrevocably and irresistibly with the life of that person. The anxiety of knowing that you'll be taken on a journey into uncharted waters, seeing that you'll be led to places you'd rather not go, knowing that the other's love will challenge you to the core of your being, and yet knowing that you can never be complete without responding to that love. And when Brother Luke is asked if he's ever been in love, he says several times yes. And then I encountered an even greater love. And I answered that love. It's been a while now, over 60 years. Certainly it seems that Brother Luke's life would have been complete without his responding to that even greater love, the one who knocked on the door of his heart. And what a journey of love his life was, serving the local Muslims as a doctor for years, choosing to stay to witness to his love of God and God's love of humanity. The Later on in the film, um, the prior Dom Christian de Serge um, says, we stay out of love and fidelity. If you ever get a chance to read his um, spiritual testament, it's only a couple of pages, but it's a masterpiece of, uh, of modern spirituality. There's an endearing practicality and wisdom in Brother Luke's reflections. There's also the mystical overtones of a man who has loved God and served humanity for a lifetime. And in a sense, it reminds me of Bernard of Clairvaux and Francis de Sales' meditations on the Song of Songs. Bernard gave 86 sermons on the, on the Song of Songs over a period of 18 years. These sermons are more monastic uh, conferences than exegetical commentaries. They're, so they're addressed to these Cistercian monks, and yet Bernard knows his brothers well. Some of these are tough men. Worldly men former knights who served in the Crusades, men who know what life is about. 
Yet Bernard's intention is to move their hearts to love God. For he is a mystic who explicitly uses the song to, um, for the purpose of enabling others to know and love God more deeply. Bernard interprets the Song of Songs in reference to the love between God and the human soul. God is deeply in love with us and wills our love in return. This love between the soul and God, which is most, the most intimate love possible, is expressed in the analogy of the bride and the bridegroom, where the intimacy of love is especially expressed. For Bernard, the Song of Songs is the book of experience, and the greatest experience is love, of which he writes about in Sermon 83. And this is an extended quote, so please hang in there. Certainly honour and glory are due to God and to him alone, but neither of these will he receive if they are not, as it were, seasoned with the honey of love. Love is sufficient of itself. It gives pleasure by itself and because of itself. It is its own merit, its own reward. Love looks for no cause outside itself, no effect beyond itself. It is its own fruit, its own object and usefulness. Its profit lies in its practice. I love because I love. I love that I may love. Love is a thing so uh, love is a great thing so long as it continually returns to its fountainhead, flows back to its source, always drawing from there the water which continually replenishes it. Of all the movements, sensations and feelings of the soul, love is the only one in which the creature can respond to the creator and make some sort of similar return, however unequal though it be. For when God loves, all he desires is to be loved in return. The sole purpose of his love is to be loved, in the knowledge that those who love him and, um, and in the knowledge that those who love him are made happy by their love of him. Well, love is sufficient of itself. I love that I may love. Bernard's very clear that love has a source, God. Not some distant deity or impersonal being, but love itself. A personal God who invites us to enter into loving communion and friendship with him. The beautiful image of flowing water, living water, draws our attention to the generative and regenerative effect of God's love. Love is a great thing so long as it continually returns to its fountainhead, flows back to its source. This is what we as Salesians are constantly called to do, to return to Jesus the fountainhead, the good shepherd, who is living water for us, who nourish us, nourishes us for mission. And Bernard's very clear, like Francis de Sales, that God's love is accessible to everyone. God's, God, desire, God loves everyone and desires our love in return. The sole purpose of God's love is to be loved, there is almost an inevitability that we should love God in return for the love, the capital L love that he has given us. And God loves us not for his sake, but for our sake. That in loving God, we may be happy because of our love of God. Our love of God may be weaker, smaller, less resplendent than God's love for us, but if we love with our whole being, nothing is lacking. 
And perhaps this is what Constitution 1, which we looked at yesterday, means when it says that the spirit formed in Don Bosco, the heart of a father and teacher, capable of total self-giving. We could meditate on this all day, and yet we need to move forward. So let's turn to St. Francis de Sales, who had a great love of and devotion for um, St. Bernard, whose writings Francis intimately knew and whom he often quoted. Naturally, Francis would agree that love is the greatest of all experiences. After studying the Song of Songs uh, and as a young student in Paris, Francis always envisaged the spiritual life as a love story that begins with the heart and overflows into daily life. When here we need to understand the heart, of course, in the biblical sense as the core of one's being, that deep inner recess, hidden recess where we encounter God face to face, heart to heart. For Francis, to grow in love of God is to transform one's heart into the image of the heart of Christ, whose this process initially begins internally, then spills over externally into daily life. To impress this idea on his readers, Francis utilised the metaphor of an almond seed, perhaps an implausible analogy for us today, but one in his time where he was drawing on the most up-to-date science of his day um, proved very effective. Our scientific understanding may have progressed, but it really doesn't restrict from the image that Francis is trying to convey. The importance of interior formation of the heart so that it can ex eventually convey externally the love of Christ. And so he writes, men engaged in horticulture tell us that if his word is written on a sound almond seed and it's placed again in its shell, carefully wrapped up and planted, whatever fruit the tree bears will have that same word stamped on it. For myself, I cannot approve of methods who, of those who try to reform a person by beginning with external things, such as bearings, dress and hair. On the contrary, it seems to me that we should begin inside. Be converted with your whole heart, God says. My child, give me your heart. Since the heart is the source of actions, as the heart is, so are they. When the divine spouse invites the soul, he says, put me as a seal on your heart, a seal on your arm. Yes, for whoever has Jesus Christ in his heart will soon have him in all his outward ways. For this reason, I have wished above all to engrave and inscribe on your heart this very holy, sacred maxim. Live Jesus. I am sure that your life, which comes from the heart, just as the almond, comes, the almond tree comes from its seed, will after that produce all its actions, which are its fruits, inscribed and engraved with the sacred word of salvation. And our beloved Jesus lives, as our beloved Jesus lives in our heart, so too will he live in all our conduct. And he will be revealed by our eyes, mouth, hands, yes, even the hair on our head. When St. Paul says these holy words, it is not that I live, but Christ who lives in me. In short, whoever wins a person's heart wins the whole person. Yet even the heart where we wish to begin must be instructed as so as how it should model its outward conduct and bearing so that by them people can see not only holy devotion but also great wisdom and prudence. 
Well, what an extraordinarily beautiful image to have lived Jesus with an exclamation mark, to have lived Jesus inscribed on our hearts. In other words, to surrender our souls completely to Jesus and make him the complete centre of our lives and to let this love overflow into our daily lives, thus transforming our lives with love and transforming our world with love. This is an important passage for understanding Francis. It comes from um, the beginning, the preface, if you like, of a chapter concerning the exercise of exterior mortification in his famous introduction to the devout life. The context text makes clear from the start, while Francis' spirituality begins with the heart in the interior, it does not remain there. As the heart grows in its capacity to love, so our outer lives will change so that the life of Christ is seen not only in our hearts, but in every aspect of our lives. The way we dress, the way we present ourselves, the way we pray, the way we go about our daily duties, the way we interact with others. In short, by the way we love in the ordinary circumstances of everyday life. As we can see, for Francis, love is not just something uh, theoretical or metaphysical. It's always practical. It's always relationship. It's always about filling one's heart with the love of God and then allowing that same love to overflow into every aspect of life. <coughs> for Francis, is particularly critical of those who divorce love of God and love of neighbour. He writes, One who is devoted to fasting considers himself truly holy as long as he is fasting, even though his heart may be full of malice. And in this fasting, he may not allow himself to dip his tongue into wine or even taste water, and yet he does not hesitate to to soak it in another person's blood by his spitefulness and slander. Strong language from the gentle Francis. Someone else considers himself holy because he says a great many prayers every day, but afterwards that same tongue is aimed at harmful, haughty and destructive words among family and neighbours. Another freely takes the contents of his purse as arms to the poor, but cannot open the warmth of his heart to forgive his enemies, while another may pardon his en enemies, but he will never pay what is due to his creditors unless the law force, forces him to do so. All these people are ordinarily considered to be religious, but they are not in any way truly holy. Saul's men searched for David in his house, but David's wife, having put a statue in his bed and covered it with a blanket, persuaded the soldiers that it was David himself who lay ill. In the same way, so many people cover themselves with any number of external actions that look like sanctity and the world thinks they are truly devout and spiritual people. But in truth, they are nothing but hollow mannequins and caricatures of holiness. Well, the gentle Francis is certainly capable of making his points forcefully. <coughs> Those who think divorce, divorcing love of God and love, and love of neighbour are fakes, hollow mannequins. He serves up tough criticism. But understandable, because for Francis, God and lo God, love of God and love of neighbour are inextricably intertwined. Yes, the love of God has two arms, the affective love of God in prayer and the effective love of God in service of one's neighbour. It takes both arms to truly love 
and embrace God. Well, our Don Bosco certainly embraced God with both arms. He makes this very clear in the concluding paragraph of, his, of the preface of The Companion of Youth. This is from 1847, during the earliest days of Don Bosco's oratory. And so it's important evidence that the source of Don Bosco's commitment and selfless love for his youngsters, that source is his love of God. My dear friends, I love you with all my heart. And it's enough for you, for you to be young, for me to love you very much. I can assure you, you will find books written by persons much more virtuous and cleverer than I. But you will struggle to find anyone who loves you in Christ Jesus more than I do. Or wants to see you truly happy more than I do. Live happily and the Lord be with you. Father John Bosco. What a stunning testament to Don Bosco's love of God being the source, origin and inspiration of his love for his youngsters. This is not, of course, a one-off statement. As we all know, Don Bosco consistently called his Salesians uh, to love the young. The most outstanding example of this comes towards the end of his life in the 1884 letter from Rome where we hear the extraordinary statement, the love must not only be loved, but they must know that they are loved. Yes, we are lovers. If we are not, we are nothing as Salesians. We love and follow Jesus to be signs and bearers of God's love to the young. Love is at the very core of our charismatic identity. <coughs> One of the amazing things about Don Bosco was not only his capacity to give love, but his willingness to receive love. Actually, his willingness to receive love from his boys with such generosity is a sign of his own humility. He didn't want them uh, to love him for his sake, but for their sake. This is an indication it was an indication of their capacity to love, that they were open to learning, growing and maturing, that their hearts may be malleable, that there is greater potential, that they will also open their hearts to God's love. Just think of that period um, just before Don Bosco collapses and enters into this great um, illness of 1846. He narrates it in the Memoirs of the Oratory, chapter 43. By his own admission, Don Bosco says that his health began to fail because of his many commitments in the prisons, the Cotolengo Institute, the Refugio, the Oratory and the schools. In addition, he also worked by night to compile the booklets that he says he absolutely needed. In the end, his beloved friend, Father Burrell, sends him to rest during the week with the parish priest of Sassi, some four kilometres from the oratory and at the base of the mountain overlooking Turin. However, rest is hard to find. As the boys discover where he's resting in Sassi, they come in crowds to see him, and the boys of the village as well. I was busier than ever, he says. Now, this story he doesn't tell in the memoirs, but it's recorded in the, um, the memoirs of the oratory, but it's recorded in biographical memoirs. The De La Salle brothers operated the school of St. Barbara, and Don Bosco was the chaplain. At the end of their annual retreat, they came in mass to looking for him to hear their confessions. When they discovered that he wasn't at the oratory and he wasn't at the refugio, they set out for Sassi. 
Despite the rain, the distance, the mud and the hunger, some 400 boys arrived for confession. (laughs) And they insisted on staying, even though they'd been told to return to school. Three other priests were quickly summoned up, but the situation was impossible. Four priests and 400 boys. (coughs) In the meantime, the preacher of the retreat and all their teachers and prominent local citizens had all gathered for the closing mass of the retreat, only to find that not a single student was at school. What a fiasco. All because these boys knew that Don Bosco loved them and they returned their love for him. They loved him in return and wanted him to hear their confessions. Well, soon after, as we know, Don Bosco collapsed and uh, or around this time, not long afterwards, Don Bosco collapsed and is carried to bed and is soon at death's door. As the news spreads, Don Bosco uh, in the memoirs narrates that a constant stream of tearful youngsters came knocking on the door to inquire about my health. They fasted, they prayed, they kept vigils, They made promises and vows to God and the Blessed Virgin that they would work work a miracle for them and save Don Bosco's life. Let's remember who these kids were. They're migrant workers far from home and family. They're unemployed street kids. They're exploited child labourers, ex-prisoners, bricklayers, stuccoers, road pavers, plasterers. Labourers working on the building sites, stone cutters, and others, including some of the better off and, and educated local lads from around Turin. But let's not be mistaken. This is nothing but a massive outpouring of youthful love for Don Bosco, the one who loved them, the one they knew loved them. The one who, by his words and actions, showed them that God loved them. It's perhaps not overstepping the mark to suggest that God could not but be moved by such a genuine heartfelt outpouring of youthful love for this priest, this poor priest whom they loved so deeply and so tenderly. Thankfully, their prayers were heard. Don Bosco recovered. And those young ragamuffins who loved him so deeply, they rejoiced. A few weeks later, on a Sunday afternoon, Don Bosco, leaning on his cane, took a short walk from the oratory, uh, to the oratory. And Father Lemoyne describes the scene in the biographical memoirs. When the boys heard that he planned to pay them a visit, they went to get him at the refugio. Several of the stronger lads carried him on an armchair while the remainder in front, behind and beside were his retinue. There were tears in every eye, in Don Bosco's too. At the oratory, the reception Uh, was a scene easier easier imagined than described. Don Bosco also addressed a few words. I want to thank you for your prayers, the prayers you said for for my recovery. I am convinced that God gave me an extension of life in answer to your prayers. Therefore, gratitude demands that I spend all of uh, all of my life for your temporal and, well, and spiritual welfare. This I promise to do as long as the Lord will permit me to remain in this world. On your part, help me to keep my promise. 
what we're witnessing here is a triad of love. God's love for Don Bosco and his boys, the boys' love for Don Bosco and God, and God's love, uh, sorry, Don Bosco's love for God and his boys. This is no theoretical, metaphysical love. This is real love, practical love, divine and human love embracing each other. And in gratitude for that love, Don Bosco commits himself to spend himself for his youngsters. And I'm sure we can imagine ourselves doing the same. Of course, the love demonstrated across these dramatic scenes of Don Bosco's uh, illness and recovery was no one-off. Throughout his life, Don Bosco loved deeply and was loved dearly. The story of Father uh, Giuseppe Vespignani is a case in point. He was already a priest when he arrived at the oratory in 1876. So by this stage, there was upwards of 600 people living at the oratory. Father Vespignani arrived, prepared to check it out, maybe stay for a year. He stayed a lifetime. Initially, he taught Latin to the Sons of Mary, the late vocations group. This is during his novitiate. He was brilliant. However, he was so brilliant that he was given the, what we might say is the equivalent to the year nine RE class. He struggled. He became discouraged and sought Don Rua's advice. He took it up, but it didn't seem to make much difference. Eventually, Don Bosco told him, meet them at the pump. And he did. And there he began to learn how to engage with the boys, to befriend them and to gain their trust. Over time, it made a huge difference. After only a year at the oratory, he made his profession and was assigned as the first novice master in Argentina. Imagine that. He was a novice, made his profession, became the novice master. And he departed on the third missionary expedition uh, to Argentina. Later, he was provincial for 20 years, where he became known as the Don Bosco of Argentina. He spent the last 10 years of his life back in Turin as a member of the General Council with particular responsibility for the schools. Around the time of Don Bosco's beatification, he wrote a memoir of his experiences uh, with Don Bosco. This includes a stunning description of the morning routine at the oratory and the love the boys expressed on a daily basis for Don Bosco. At that central place uh, uh, in the oratory, the side of the beginning of his work, one can see the spirit that animated that throng of boys. During the frugal breakfast, there were excited games that followed. And then a, crowd, a cry and applause would suddenly break out. Viva Don Bosco! There would be a great rush to meet him, to kiss his hand, to win a smile or a word from him. Making his way from the church to his room, Don Bosco would be followed across the playground by a slow, joyful procession. He would pause often talking to one and another about his appetite and health, always being their friend and by his fatherly glance, spreading a wave of cheerfulness, goodwill and enthusiasm for doing good. The picture displayed on the great door of St. Peter's in Rome on June 2nd, 1929, that's for the beatification, 
and later to be in the main centres of the old and new world, showing Don Bosco being carried in triumph by his rascals, is the pinnacle of his educational method, religion, charity, fatherliness. <clears throat> What strikes me in that image is firstly the enthusiasm of the boys. They rush to meet him, to kiss his hand, to win a smile from him. There's this slow, joyful procession across the playground, a personal word for this one and that, a wave of cheerfulness and goodwill that spreads across the whole um, of the compound. It's a truly remarkable scene that unambiguously illustrates the reality of Don Bosco's love of God overflowing into his love of his youngsters and their reciprocal love of him. It's clear in the life of Don Bosco, love of God and love of his youngsters are inseparable. And it's the same thing with our consecration as Salesians of Don Bosco. Love of God and love of neighbour, love of Jesus and love of the young, consecration, community and mission are inseparable. For ours is an apostolic consecration, as, con as Constitution 3 clearly says. We live as disciples of the Lord by the grace of the Father, who consecrated us through the gift of his Spirit and sends us out to be apostles to the young. Through our religious profession, we offer our souls to God in order to follow Christ and to work with him in building up the kingdom. Our apostolic mission, our fraternal community, and the practice of the evangelical councils are the inseparable elements of our consecration, which we live as a single movement of love towards God and towards our brothers and sisters. Our mission sends, sets the whole tenor of sorry, our mission sets the tenor of our whole life. It specifies the task we have in the church and our place among other religious families. As Salesians, we freely choose to respond in love to the God of love who calls us, <coughs> consecrates us and sends us as apostles to the young. Our apostolic consecration has three inseparable components. Our apostolic mission, our fraternal community, and our practice of our vows. The distinction between consecration and mission is a false dichotomy. And I suspect that the community dimension of our consecration is often overlooked as perhaps an unavoidable necessity, an occupational hazard, rather than a core, essential, and indeed vital component of our apostolic identity. The three elements of our consecration, mission, community, and daily living of our vows are inseparable a single movement of love towards God and our brothers and sisters. Let's return to Brother Luke. The young woman asks him, Have you ever been in love? Brother Luke responds, Yes, several times. There's a lengthy pause before Brother Luke continues. And then I encountered another love even greater. And I answered that love. It's been a while now, over 60 years. 
as the lesions, we've also chosen to respond to that even greater love. That love that knocked so persistently on the doorway of our hearts, that drew us irresistibly towards itself, that embraced us and invited us to love, to respond in love. Yes, we discovered, as did St. Bernard, that love is enough of itself, and that we can truly say with him, I love because I love, I love that I may love. And we have discovered, along with St. Francis, that true love of God is only genuine when it is shared with others, when it's given outward expression as love of neighbour. And from Don Bosco, we know that our love of neighbour is first and foremost love of the young. God is love, and it is of the very nature of love that it is shared. We share with the young our love of God, and we are ready to accept their love in return, that we may be signs and bearers of God's love, especially to the poorest. Yes, our lives, our identity as Salesians, is nothing more and nothing less than to be lovers. Lovers of God, lovers of each other as confrères, lovers of the young. As St. Bernard suggests, let's continually return to the fountainhead of love, the even greater love, who is the joy and love of our lives, to purify, intensify and multiply our love so that we can love as Christ loves, with the heart of the Good Shepherd. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, the Lord, and the Lord, and the Lord.